Well, hi everyone. I'm here in Lansing, Iowa on the bank of the Mississippi River. You can see the historic Black Hawk Bridge in the background. The bridge is currently being replaced. I've done a previous video about this and the resident engineer for this project with Iowa DOT, Clayton Burke, was kind enough to spend lots of time with me here this morning and answer a lot of questions and he gave me a lot of great background information that I'll share with you today. So let's get to it. So what I want to focus on in today's video is the movement that's occurred during a couple of episodes, one last year and one this year, that resulted in the temporary closure of the bridge. Last year they had to do some remediation work to support the existing bridge. So I'm going to get into those details and take a deeper dive into the technical aspects of how do you protect existing bridges during the construction of an adjacent bridge as part of a bridge replacement project. So for background information on this bridge, please refer to my previous video, the link's in the description. As I mentioned, this bridge was most recently closed from May 17th to June 9th. The contractor was installing piling to support his support tower, false work tower, for the new bridge. And movement was detected at the pier and so the work was immediately shut down until Iowa DOT could complete an assessment and they ruled that the bridge was safe to reopen, which they did on June 9th. But the contractor has had to stop any vibration inducing activity in the meantime. So as I mentioned, this outage last year was about two months long and because movement was detected at the bridge piers and it appears to be associated with the vibratory installation of the permanent casing for the drilled shaft foundations for the new bridge. The prime contractor, Kramer North America, had to essentially replace those bridge piers with new piers supported by steel pipe pile that were driven to bedrock. Just a quick reminder, this is the location of the project. Northeastern Iowa, the bridge crosses the Mississippi River from Lansing, Iowa to Wisconsin. The bridge was opened in 1931. Just an aerial view of the construction. Overall project cost is currently estimated at $140 million. Federal government is going to pay 80% of that, which is standard. And then the states of Iowa and Wisconsin will split the remaining 20% portion. Here's some renderings of what the new bridge looks like. A very similar structure to the bridge it's replacing, and that was on purpose to preserve the historical aspects of what's been at this location for nearly 100 years. So it's a beautiful bridge. There's a lot of great information about this project on the Iowa DOT website. So again, all these references I have a link to in the description to this video. And when this story hit the news a few weeks ago about this recent bridge closure, it got me thinking, it's like, wow, this seems really familiar. And uh, sure enough, I had looked at performing construction phase testing of the drill shaft foundations. And uh, ultimately I didn't uh, secure that work but uh, I had a lot of project information in my files that I reviewed for producing this video. And you can see the new drilled shafts are 11 and a half foot diameter with 11 foot diameter rock socket. So well over 100 feet in total length. It's just a cross section of what the new foundation looks like. You have three drilled shafts at each pier. And as I mentioned, the rock sockets for the drilled shafts extend into the bedrock. So this is a comparison. Overall length of the new foundations are 150 feet versus the old bridge with the timber piling that was probably no more than 55 foot in length. In fact, there wasn't a lot of information available about the foundations for this existing bridge. I did find this old reference here where it references 40 foot deep piling, which are 55 feet below the water level. And I suspect these were oak pile. This is what timber pile looks like. For those of you who aren't familiar with it, it's basically a tree with the branches cut off and the narrow end goes on the bottom, which would be the top part of the tree. So as I mentioned, I have a lot of project documents from the original bid time back in 2023. And Iowa DOT took responsibility for the instrumentation and monitoring program of the existing bridge during construction. So they had their own consultant to do that work. So the plan was to monitor vibration, as well as tilt and displacement of the existing bridge piers. And I commend Iowa DOT for doing that. Uh, they didn't just leave it all up to the contractor, which, you know, generally I'm in favor of letting the contractor assume the risks and 
dictate the means and methods accordingly. But there are some situations where I think the owner really needs to insert themselves as was done here. And, and I think it was appropriate when you have a sensitive structure that needs to be protected. You have to put some guidelines out there. You have to be proactive. And, and that's what they did. And as part of those specification requirements, the contractor had to prepare a detailed summary of the proposed means and methods of construction for all phases and tasks with the potential to produce ground vibration, ground movement, or settlement that may affect any portions of the existing bridge. So that information had to be submitted to Iowa DOT at least 30 days in advance. But again, the contractor is still responsible for executing his construction means and methods and not cause any issues with the existing bridge. And the contractor also had to prepare an alert response plan. It says here summarizing the response protocols that will be followed in the event of an exceedance of the vibration, tilt, or displacement alert thresholds established in the instrumentation and monitoring plan. So the instrumentation and monitoring plan was prepared by the consultant on behalf of Iowa DOT. And let's just look at some of these threshold values here. What caught my eye was the vibration alert threshold of two inch per second peak particle velocity, which strikes me as rather high when I read that. And uh, a lot of times when you see a peak particle velocity of two inches per second allowed in a project specification, most of the time that reference came from a specification for blast induced vibration. In my experience, allowable peak particle velocities for construction induced vibrations, which tend to be in the 10 to 30 hertz range, are much lower. And so I'll get into that here in a bit. Also, they had thresholds on vertical displacement, plus or minus three quarters of an inch. And then they had some specifications on out of plane tilt of each pier. So very rational approach, in my opinion. So one of the better specifications that I've come across in my practice, my, my firm performs vibration monitoring of construction-induced vibrations, particularly for pile driving. And we also often do pre-construction or post-construction condition surveys. And one of the specifications I came across in my practice, which was quite useful, is the Swiss piling standard. And this standard is geared to provide protection to existing structures from vibrations caused by pile driving. And they start out by categorizing the structure type, one through four. And I would probably put an existing nearly 100-year-old bridge on relatively shallow timber pile foundations in category four structural type, which means buildings or structures which are especially sensitive or worthy of protection. And you can see for category four, the max value of peak particle velocity is quite low, around three millimeters per second. Now, I haven't gone quite that low in my practice, but 12 millimeters per second, or roughly a half an inch per second peak particle velocity is typically what I see on projects like this. And you can have a variety of uh, distortions associated with a building that causes damage from uh, settlement or just movement of the structure from adjacent construction vibrations. You have differential settlement, you can have ground distortion, you can have settlement of the structure due to essentially liquefaction or rearrangement of soil particles in the foundation soils below the structure. And then you could just have structural damage purely to shaking of the, the structure itself from the vibrations. And so I mentioned liquefaction. I recycled this image from a video I did on the Millennium Tower in San Francisco. And that building was founded on relatively shallow, I mean, I think 80 to 90 foot long concrete piling. And they didn't go to bedrock. These pilings stopped at the top of a clay formation. So if you go back to the principle developed by Carl Tursagi decades ago of the equivalent mat or equivalent raft foundation, all these individual piling bearing at the same depth really act as one big footing. And so in this case, if you have timber piling 40 to 50 foot deep roughly into the alluvial soil, sands and silts, in the river channel here at the Mississippi River, you can cause problems if you cause liquefaction or disturbance of those foundation soil layers below the tips of the piling. And I have limited information about the specifics in terms of instrumentation readings, but in a general sense, I think that may have been a factor here in causing the existing bridge piers to tilt. Now, this is an excerpt from another specification. This was for a railroad bridge replacement in Burlington, Iowa. I worked on this over 15 years ago. But the old bridge, the old railroad bridge, 
was going to remain in service while they built the new railroad bridge. And that existing railroad bridge had its pier founded on a real raft. It was a raft constructed of tree branches that they lashed together and they built the pier on top of the raft. And as they added each course of masonry block and infilled the interior of the pier, that mat would sink deeper and deeper into the sandy river channel deposits until it reached equilibrium, as I recall, about a depth of uh, 30 feet below the mud line. So again, that was a very settlement sensitive structure. And like most projects, the contractor had to submit his plans for protecting the existing structure from vibration induced damage. And that resulted in the use of a casing oscillator. A casing oscillator pushes and twists a casing into place. It's not driven by impact. It's not driven using a vibratory hammer. So it's a uh, much less vibration associated with the installation of this permanent casing, which needs to be done to facilitate the installation of the drill shaft foundations. So once they install the casing, they drill the interior out, extend the drilling into the rock socket, place a steel reinforcing cage, and place concrete from the bottom up, and tie that into their pier cap. The problem with a casing oscillator is it tends to cause the price of drill shaft installation to roughly triple. So it's not a minor consideration. And I think on projects involving public funds, you would hope that the DOT is diligent about not spending any more money than they need to. So there's some project management decisions that have to factor in. This Blackhawk Bridge has daily traffic volumes of about 4,000 vehicles per day. Now that's really impactful to the local community if those vehicles weren't allowed to cross due to a closure, but it's not like a Washington Bridge in Rhode Island where you have nearly 100,000 vehicles a day crossing that bridge. So that has to be factored in. How much risk is going to be taken by the DOT in general and the contractor to execute in order to protect the existing structure, but also to not unduly escalate the project construction costs as well as extending the project construction schedule. So one thing that can be done in this situation is if you're hampered in your construction methodology because of the need to limit vibrations that could impact the existing nearby structures, you could actually underpin the existing foundations. So in this case, an option would be say micropile that are drilled through the, the cap, the pile cap here at the base of the pier and extended into bedrock. This is what these look like. These micropile, as they're termed, are typically having a diameter of under a foot, 30 centimeters, and are accompanied by steel reinforcement and grout injection. So you have an external casing, you have the hole extended into rock, and the top is connected into the pile cap. So you gain support in axial compression, axial uplift, as well as bending. So you could transfer a lot of the applied loading from the bridge superstructure to the foundation well below those timber pile foundations into the bedrock. So given that the contractor is currently prohibited from doing anything that would induce vibrations, but still needs to complete the bridge, uh, between the contractor and Iowa DOT, they're reassessing their means and methods and how they're gonna go forward. Currently, the plan was to complete this bridge in 2026 and the approach spans mostly on the Wisconsin side by 2027. But this issue here with tilting of the existing uh, bridge piers could risk delaying the overall completion schedule for the bridge. So I'll continue to follow this story and provide updates as the uh, news develops. So with that, I want to thank those of you who've contributed to buy me a coffee. It's a great way to support the channel. I really appreciate it. There's a link in the description if you're so inclined. I also want to thank the channel members as well as those of you who provided super thanks. Again, those are excellent ways to support the channel. So stay tuned, everyone.